We had a lot of uh, audio last week. A lot of conversation was had between Michael Winger and uh, Will Dawkins and Ted Leonsis. They all gave interviews, uh, including to us uh, here at the Team 980. Russell and I had a bunch of great or had a couple of great chats. Um, Leonsis was on with Grand Danny as well. Um, but sometimes you just get a different conversation and hear something and you think it, it it's worthwhile playing and um, kind of reshapes how you think about some things. Um, that was the conversation I had when I listened on the way into work today of the Woj pod. Um, and I saw a bunch of clips making uh, the, the, its way around Wizards Twitter over the weekend. But uh, Adrian Wojnarowski, who was in town uh, for the press conference. Um, and I'll just, I mean, it is what it is. Um, I actually asked, uh, Woj if he would be willing to come on the show. Um, and I said, I know you're here to do interviews, not be interviewed, but you know, would you, Whoa, got some funky stuff happening on the, the stream here. Let's, uh, let's remove that. Okay. Uh, it's not take command time. Anyway, the point is, uh, I asked Woj if he would, you know, I, you know, you're here to do interviews, not be interviewed. And he's like, I appreciate you asking, but, um, I think I'm going to pass on this time. It's like, okay. But I also knew that Woj would probably be contributing to the show because he, uh, the man, the man knows how to get answers. That is why he is him. And people are, are very comfortable talking to him, um, because he is a holder of information and thus the answers he's going to get out of certain people are just different than the answers anybody else can get. Um, it's, it's a skill in the interview space. And so he sat down with Leonsis. He also sat down with Winger. And the stuff Leonsis said was pretty fascinating um, in a couple of realms. But there's also a little bit of revisionist history that I feel like Ted did that I think is worth revisiting, framing. I don't even know if it's revisionist history. Just uh, rosier than should be painting of what was. You know, forgetting a few convenient details. And... Doing it while also saying this, which I think is the most important thing that was said um, was said pretty much all week last week, which is, Ted Leonsis, how would you do as an owner these past dozen years? Did you have to take time to do that to say, I want this to look different? Yeah, I gave myself uh, failing grades. Okay. That's the most important thing. He's, well, I'm sorry, you, you gave yourself what? Yeah, I gave myself uh, failing grades. If he realizes the things he's done is a failure, that means everything is on the table. And that is the most important thing. Now that I, I have not had since he decided to fire Tommy Shepard, any reservations about the fact that Ted had put everything on the table. Um, this is someone who very clearly wants to win. Um, I think he is driven by that as well as driven to make money. He is definitely a business-minded person, um, and it's, a, it's his billion-dollar company. Of course he wants to make money. But I, I also think that he is willing to try things differently than he, he has before. Um, he did also mention that he is someone who went uh, down the rebuild path before, and, and they did – the thing that we wish they would have done a couple of years ago here, uh, where they traded multiple all-stars. Uh, obviously, they did ultimately trade John here, but they traded Karan and Gil and Anton back in the day, and they wind up getting four straight top five picks. And the funny thing is, is when Ted recounts that stretch, he says, well, Wall was the number one consensus pick. Yep, he was. No problem with it. Uh, and then he says, oh, we got Bradley the next year at three, and then we took Otto the year after that, and we were the first team to draft and then max three guys. And what I hope Ted realizes is that, one, there's there's a year missing there, which we'll get to in a second, and that's the revisionist history a little bit, or just a mistelling, a, conden uh, a condensing it, whatever. the I don't, I don't know that he did that on purpose. But there, it, it's pretty significant to get the, the four right. But there's also a reason that a team like Oklahoma City, who came as close to doing what they did as any team over the last decade and a half, where you have those multiple picks years in a row, did not do it the way Washington did. They, they picked. They had Jeff Green, Kevin Durant, Russell Westbrook, and James Harden back to back to back to back to back. 
and they chose to trade Green and trade Harden. Some would argue they traded Harden a year too soon, but they knew they had to do it. And what that did was give them a decade of competitiveness until Durant decided to leave. And so bragging that you signed three guys to a max contracts isn't actually the flex that you think it is. Although, again, because Ted did say the magic words. Yeah, I gave myself uh, failing grades. Then I'm willing to at least be open to the fact that he thinks that was a mistake. Now, it is also very much worth pointing out, not to be a jerk about it, but like you also drafted Jan Vesely at six in 2011, and that's a big, gigantic whoopsie. Like that's the one that kills you. Because you have Wall already, and here's a couple of guys that went after in that draft. Kemba went at nine. That's probably not a fit with Wall, but whatever. Clay goes 11. Kawhi goes 15. Even uh, Nick Vucevic goes 16. Jimmy Butler goes 30. Um, Alec Burks, who's like a good player and has played the entire time since he's still in the league, uh, went at 12. Uh, the Morris Twins went 13 and 14. So Jan Vesely is a pretty big mess up at at 20 or at, at pick six in the middle of what was otherwise, I think, three solid picks. Porter is always going to feel wrong at, in that 2013 draft, but that is that's just a weird draft. It's one of the worst all times. There's two dudes who were like really good in that draft, maybe three. Um, Giannis, CJ McCollum, and then Rudy Gobert. But Giannis, McCollum, Gobert are the three top players in that draft by a decent amount. I think they're the only guys that have really made all-star teams. And you're talking about guys like Steven Adams, KCP, like obviously a very good player. It's about to win another ring. Um, you know, Otto. But like there's no no real definitive like, oh, man, you missed your third star in that draft unless you want to say Giannis. McCollum, obviously you're not drafting the year after you draft Beal. And Gobert went 27. So it's not like anybody knew he was going to be what he is. Giannis, nobody knew either. Um, but there's some people that had some inklings. And so if you wanted to swing big. And that's, I think, the the other part of this that's really a bummer is you start to look back through the draft. And Ted said immediately after he said... Yeah, I gave myself uh, failing grades. He said, you know, we thought we wanted to build through the draft and so we did and we you know he gives kind of his version of of what I've just given you and then he says you know slowly but surely we abandon the plan and what I think is interesting about the draft picks that ultimately followed and specifically the ones in the Tommy Shepard era is they took no swings like Jan Vesely whether it was because Vesely so scarred them that they decided never again or whatever other reason they took no swings they took super safe players year after year in places where other teams were willing to swing a little bigger. And and some of them hit after the Wizards did. And they, whether it's a Troy Brown Jr. or Rui Hachimura, Denny Avia to an extent was, was that. Denny's a little bit of a bigger swing, but I don't think anyone looks at Denny and is like, ah, that's a future superstar. Like there's just, there's no, not enough risk taking, um, and, and also, I think there's this thought that with a guy like Johnny Davis, like, oh, his floor is this, so we know we're at least getting that, and then we'll see about the ceiling. And it's like, that's not how this works. There's no guaranteed floor in this league. Often guaranteed floor guys actually aren't that good because there's inherently, the way we talk about them, some kind of lack of physical ability or talent. Now, Davis might break that mold a little bit because I actually think Davis is a high upside based off some of his athletic profile or whatever, defensively speaking. But we'll see. We're, we're going to table the Johnny Davis conversation for later. But guys like Troy Brown Jr. is like, oh, he's just a solid player. Otto Porter, solid player. We know we know what he is. And it's like, okay, cool. Does that mean what you think it means? And that's how you get stuck exactly where they did. That and they locked themselves in to Wall, to Beal, to Porter. And then... And they, they thought that was enough. And as a result, they make these short-term moves to the point that in 2016 and 2017, they didn't have not just a first-round pick, they didn't make a pick in either draft. And so sacrificing your... Say, oh, we have a team that could you know get into the playoffs and 
they're probably going to lose in the first round. If we add a Bogdanovich, we can get to the second round. It's like, okay, are you really a championship contender? Or maybe you should hold on to that first round pick. Maybe you should should actually get the young player on the rookie contract that gives you some sustainability over time. And that's where things went so far south. And, and you get stuck in this middle, which is kind of what Ted talked about as well, with Woj. I feel more that... Um because we didn't have a plan. We're very opportunistic. Trade deadline would come. You know, I'd get brief. These are the kinds of moves that we would consider making. And then there'd be another last-minute phone call, and bang, a trade would come before you, and they'd say, this is what we're doing. And what are you going to say? No, don't do it, of course. And you'd end up with a player, and now you had to rechange, rejigger what the plan is and the style is because of the player that you you got. And we made a lot of trades. We we've signed so many players. We we dressed so many players through the last three or four years, but we ended up with the same record. Yeah, they just kept staying in place. And part of that was because they'd acquire players all of the same type and same caliber that had no upper mobility. They were never getting the players that were going to get better. And what that left was a fan base with no hope, which is something Leon's just addressed. I want to play that for you next. And then also I'm curious, as you hear Ted talk and hear me kind of talk about this, uh, but especially this next bite that I'm going to play you from Ted in the next five minutes, does it change your opinion of, of where we are now? I mean, a lot of you had hope anyway. But does it maybe ease any remaining concerns to hear Ted Leonsis admit, yeah, I I failed as an owner? 301 230 We'll take your calls on that next. It's the Hoffman Show on the Team 980 and always live on the free Odyssey app. So Ted Leonsis says he's failed as an owner. Uh, this, again, from the Woj Pod over the weekend. Did you have to take time to do that to say, I want this to look different? Yeah, I gave myself uh, failing grades. And I would say, let me reword that. That's not Ted saying he's totally failed as an owner, but like clearly his role in where the Wizards have been the past couple of years, he feels like he could have done better. It's worth the full interview because he talks about, Woj asks really good questions, and and Ted and Woj clearly have some sort of relationship that Leontes feels fairly comfortable answering them. But he, he talks about, you know, the... Uh, being stuck in the middle. He talks about some of the challenges of how they've got this organization set up that are maybe a little bit different. Um, He talks about some of his goals and and some of the mistakes he's made along the way and perhaps allowed to happen along the way. But to me, this was the, the biggest kind of outside of the admitting that he's, he's failed in his own, uh, which he did to an extent uh, with Grant and Danny as well. There was a great clip where Grant's like, hey, well, what what do you what do these guys know? And like, what's the formula? How do you crack that with the Wizards when you've done it with your other franchise? And he says, Well, if I knew, I would have done it by now. Um, that's another way of admitting what he admitted here. But one thing that I appreciate about Leonsis compared to, say, Snyder. Um, now there's a lot of things I appreciate about Leonsis compared to Snyder. This is the, literally the lowest bar. But Dan always, it felt like he reported to no one. Like, Dan did what Dan wanted for Dan, 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 Dan at all times. Ted, I think at times, perhaps is a little bit, um, like, might have his eyes on the money more than a fan who is not running the organization. And whether you see that as criticism or, like, smart business, I'll leave in the eyes and the ears of all of you. Um, but like he is running a business and of course that's going to impact things. Um, but he certainly is someone who's like, well, we could also make money off of this or get more eyes on our TV network or whatever he does, as opposed to kind of this singular focus on winning that fans have, whether the fans, uh, actually have the right ideas in terms of how to get that done or not. But the fact that Leonsis does feel responsible to fans is something that is different than a lot of sports owners who tend to adopt this, it's my team, bleep all of you attitude. They are stewards, though. Um, you know, it's so funny uh, because 
I sometimes uh, art and and real life mix, and there is uh, I couldn't remember for a second whether this was an actual team owner talking or a clip from Ted Lasso, but it's a clip from Ted Lasso. Um, and I was watching, uh, my wife and I were watching it last night. Um, got two two episodes left in the series, um, so we're almost caught up. Uh, and and the season finale and what is probably the series finale still to come, but the Super League episode is the one that we watched last night. So spoiler alert if you're way behind on Ted Lasso, um, but they're, they have this idea of a Super League a la the real idea of the Super League in soccer and uh, Rebecca Walton, the character in Ted Lasso who owns AFC Richmond, the team that Ted Lasso coaches, gives this beautifully written speech about that is clearly also not just you know art, but is th- their kind of stance of how they feel about sports as the writers of the show and a reflection on our actual society about we are stewards of the game. This is a game at the end of the day. This is something that all of us came to because we loved it, not just because we want to make money, not just because we like the power, but because at the end of the day, we are stewards of this thing, this game, this child's game that is played at such a high level that 20,000 of us are, you know, if, you know, now I'm, I'm mixing my, my monologue here and, and, the one in the show, but you know, if you're a soccer stadium in, in the top flight of England, 80,000 people come see because this child's game that we all love so much is played at such an extraordinarily high level. And so when Leonce said this to Woj, it was a bit of an eye opening moment and something that I respect Ted for a lot. You know, I was very patient with the. Uh the Wizards organization. I've only owned the team a dozen years. It's not like, you know, this is a forever thing. But I just, I was frustrated. And I really, I think, was reflecting to how I felt I'd let down the fan base. Um, Everyone needs to know who they report to. I have to report to somebody. I have partners, but I'm, I'm the main owner. I have to report to the fans. And our fans have been loyal. Our business is good. We're one of the largest, in terms of revenue, sports organizations on the planet. But I don't feel like I was giving the fans something to fall in love with, to cheer for authentically. We weren't giving them hope and promise. A lot of people have asked me, and I I don't know hate to make it about myself it's very anti of what the journalism feel like my broadcast journalism degree feels like it's creeping back towards the people that gave it to me for me even bringing this up but it's been asked of me so i'm just going to address it there are people that have asked me if they think my interview with tommy shepherd had anything to do with him ultimately getting fired and i've always said no like ted is making evaluations based off of what the basketball team is doing with direction that they're going and then i heard that answer and it's not. I don't want credit for any part of this because I don't want, you know, the proverbial blood on my hands. I'm not trying to do interviews to get people fired. But at the end of the day, like I'm the reason that I do interviews with people that are in power is for accountability. The reason that I do those interviews is because and why I take them very, very seriously, um, especially at a point where the team is at kind of a, a critical point in their their trajectory, is because. You, the fans, deserve answers. And what struck me about the interview I did with Tommy is not any particular back and forth we had. And I know everyone loves to point to the, oh, so you're not a big Kyle Kuzma fan thing. And hilariously, I didn't realize remotely how big that was going to blow up, in part because I thought he was joking, um, which probably honestly saved me from having a different reaction. Um But that clearly struck a chord with fans and the preaching of patience after four years of not making anywhere close to a significant playoff run really hit a chord with fans. And so in that way, the fan backlash, not anything, if if the interview exists in a vacuum without uh, how people react to it, that interview might not have moved the needle at all. And I still don't know that it did. This is me now speculating, reading into what Leonsis uh, was selling Adrian Wojnarowski. But I do think that the way all of you perceived that and and ultimately very vocally made your voices heard did probably plant a seed in Ted's head somewhere that like, hey, we got a disgruntled fan base and we better have a plan to fix it. 
And then what ultimately leads to him moving on from Shepard is the fact that Shepard could not present a plan. That much Ted was very, very clear on. They continued to meet into the offseason, and ultimately they did not have a plan that he was happy with if they could come up with a plan at all, and thus he makes the change and he goes outside the organization. But the groundwork for that, whether it was the interview I did or others, was the fans going, this ain't it, Ted. And he hears that, and and that's a good, healthy relationship to have. Not that you can be reactive all the time, because you have to understand the plan and understand your team's timeline and be able to deal with some parts that aren't going to be super fun. But when you're having those nadirs in support, and on top of that, you don't feel like you have a way out, that is absolutely the time to make a change, and that's what Leonsis did. Take a couple calls on that, at least one, 301-230-0980. Let's see what Bob in D.C. has got to say, and then if we got more calls, we'll take them on the other side of the break. Bob, thanks for holding through uh, my talking there. You're on the Hoffman Show. Hey, thanks for having me. Um, I couldn't agree more with your statement about the, that floor guy. That's exactly what it is. And um, it was pretty refreshing to hear Leon to say that because I was listening to that press conference as well. And I've always wondered why we can never get free agents to come here, especially when most of the league is from here. Right. So that's that's really all I had to say. All right, Bob, thanks. Yeah, I mean, during the presser last week, he says, like, we need to figure out how to make D.C. a destination. And something that I thought was interesting um, in the Woj interview as well was he, I think, really would love to get a high-caliber point guard in here because that guy, and I think they saw this with Westbrook, and I do wonder if that's another move that really kind of upset him. He liked having Westbrook here because what Westbrook did was got other guys paid. Like, you play with a John, you play with a Russ. Those assist numbers have to go to somebody. And so part of the reason Brad gets paid is because he plays with John and he plays with Russ and they give him the contract. And now he's playing with, you know, all due respect, Monte's a, a very good NBA player, but he's not those guys. And we see the numbers don't look the same. Um, that is the reality of the NBA. And so... You know, part of being a destination organization is not just your medical, not just your facility, not just your coaching staff. It's who do you have on the roster, obviously. And that is something that this new front office, uh, Will Dawkins mainly, but obviously Michael Winger as well, and Travis Schlenk have to get right, is who's the guy that's going to have the ball in his hands, and is that someone that other NBA stars want to play with? That's how you become a free agent, slash general NBA, you know, whether forced trade, player acquisition destination. It's the Hoffman Show on the Team 980, always live as well on the free Odyssey app, streaming live on YouTube, youtube.com slash at the Team 980. This is West on Zell Jr. Deal, leveling outside the arc, stops, takes a three, it's there. You listen to the Hoffman Show on the Team 980. Assassin-like. The Odyssey app.